Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome once again to our 11 o'clock service of worship here at Elm Road United Methodist Church. And as always, I'm glad that each and every one of you are here with us today. Before we begin, are there any announcements that we would like to share? Grace upon grace, grace upon our sins and through all of our iniquities. 
As uh, you can see in the chancel rail, uh, we once again have many prayer shawls and many uh, items that have been made by our Stitches of Caring group. And this morning, uh, we're going to take the opportunity to the time to, to once again bless these items as they go out uh, beyond our church to others who hopefully uh, are surrounded by the love and the grace and the hope that they represent. Another thing I want to uh, share with you this morning, if, if you remember, this group was started by Lois Dobbs, and uh, of course Lois cannot be here with us today. She is in Liza's place, very, very ill. So we want to remember our sister Lois in our prayers, and also you who is with us this morning. So, if any of the group would like to come up, as usual, to either kneel or stand, uh, I would ask you to come at this time, please. If not, may we pray. Eternal and gracious God, once again, we do thank you for those persons involved in the ministry of the Stitches of Caring, for the good work that they do indeed. So at this time we pray that you would bless these items before us, made by their loving hands. And we pray as always, O oh Lord, that they who receive the shawls, the scarves, whatever they may be, but once again be reminded of your grace, of your love, and of your care. And certainly today, O oh Lord, we pray this, that you continue to be with our sister Lois Scott, who started this group, and that you continue to surround her with your care, with your love, and with your grace. For this we ask, and for this we pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Take, take this opportunity to let you know that this is the last performance of the Children's Choir as we take a break for the summer. And I just wanted to thank them and the parents for getting them here every Sunday for their rehearsals. And our numbers have gone up and our numbers have gone down, but this group has always put their full hearts into it and they have been so much fun to work with. And I also didn't do this last week, but I did thank my bell choir, half my bell choir is not even here this week, but I wanted to thank them as well for all of their dedicated service this past year. It's always a blessing to work with all the members of my choirs, and I really, I think I get the most out of it because we have a really good time. So today we have two songs for you, and we're going out with a bag as usual, so I hope you enjoy. <coughs> Don't forget. 
Thank you, Molly and the young folks, for uh, well, sharing your special talent with us throughout the year. And I hope you have a uh, what well, sort of a little break here, right? Yeah, have, have a good break indeed. The scripture that I'm going to share with you today is from First Peter chapter two, verse four through six. Come to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by the people, but he is precious to God who chose him. And now God is building you as living stones into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are God's holy priest, who offer the spiritual sacrifices that please him, because of Jesus Christ. As the scriptures express it, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem, a chosen cornerstone, and anyone who believes in him will never be disappointed. At this time, may we stand and sing our hymn of preparation.
may we pray. Oh gracious God, now that the word has been read, now it is time for the word to be proclaimed. And as always, Lord, we do ask this, that, Lord, once again you would speak to our hearts. And uh, hopefully, Lord, if you speak to us, we'll be able to hear it. So this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. That's a, uh, well, you know, I, I often say this, and I probably say it too many times, you know, this is one of my favorite scriptures, this is one of my favorite scriptures, but, you know, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I yeah, yeah, believe that. You know, uh, it tells us, Peter tells us that Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone upon which life and faith in the church is built. And even though that cornerstone was, and I suppose is, rejected by men, it is very, very precious in the sight of God. And of course he goes on, if you read on in that passage, he says some wonderful things like, we are a chosen generation, we are a, a royal priesthood, we are folks that have been called from darkness into light, we have experienced the mercy and the grace of Almighty God, and then of course he also says that we are living stones, being built as it were into a, into a spiritual house, a spiritual temple, and even though real stones and living stones are all flawed and all they're all ragged, they're all imperfect, God in his wisdom places those living stones together. And we are able to do the work, each and every one of us, somehow, some way, that God has called us to do. This is a heritage Sunday. I, I don't always preach uh, you know, a heritage sermon, but I decided that I would do that today. And uh, start out by saying this, that the reason that we're here today, first and foremost, is because we are Christians who have professed a hope and a trust in that chief cornerstone who is Jesus Christ. The second reason we are here as Protestant Christians is because of a living stone whose name was what? Martin Luther. Martin Luther, good, good. Thirdly, the reason that we are here today as people called Methodists is because of a living stone whose name was? Oh, you're good today, folks. Yeah, very good. I'm going to speak a little about Brother John this morning. You know, John was born in 1703, and, and he was born to the Reverend Samuel and Susanna Wesley. He was the 15th of 17 children. Things have changed, right? <laughs> God bless his mother <laughs> Susanna was quite a, a quite a woman indeed in, in more ways than one. Different time though it truly was because of those 17 children, only 10 actually survived infancy. Different time, surely. One of the uh, most legendary events in the life of John must have happened to him when he was only five years old. Of course, his father was a, a minister and they were living at the Parsonage at Epworth, and on a cold winter's night, the Parsonage caught fire. And the fire soon engulfed the house, and you know what Samuel and Susanna did? They, you know, they went around the house, and they gathered up all the kids, and they took them outside, and they did a head count. And once they did a head count, they noticed that John himself was not there. And of course, Reverend Wesley got down on his knees as soon as he saw that John was not there, and commanded the soul of his young son to Almighty God because he knew that he was dead, for sure. But they looked up, and in the second story window, there was little John at the window trying to get out. He stood up on a chest, another man got a ladder, and he plucked Wesley from the burning house just in the nick of time. And I tell you what, that event made a lasting impression on the life of John Wesley because on that night he became no longer a child of the parsonage. And in his mind, and in, in his parents' mind, he was a child of, of destiny. You know, God had had a hand in saving this young man. And Wesley would use 
that scripture the rest of his life saying that I was a brand plucked from the birth. He always felt the hand of God upon his life and a sense of destiny. And I suppose that begs the question for each and every one of us. You know, have there been times in our life where, you know, we look back and maybe we understand by looking back somehow, some way, it was only by the grace and the mercy and the hand of God that I actually got through that difficult time of putting it in. anybody? I mean, you know, it's amazing. Why don't we take the time to do that and see the hand of God hopefully somehow upon our own lives. We're here today, and you know, you can thank who you want to thank, but I'm here today, I know, by the grace of Almighty God to make it through what I've had to make it through. Just, just to be here this morning. Truly really a wonderful thought, a wonderful insight indeed. Now, John was uh, a very educated man. Now, I know what some people think of Methodist ministers today, right? Loud preaching, fried chicken eating, parsons that sometimes don't have a whole lot of sense. I've heard people say that more than once. But, uh, you know, John and his brother Charles were, they were educated at Oxford. Oxford Dunham, I suppose. And, of course, his brother Charles, they were both Anglican priests. His brother Charles is more noted for writing 6,000 hymns. We've already sang two of, his, two of his hymns today. We'll sing one more before we close. But uh, when they were in college, they decided that uh, they wanted to start a prayer meeting, or I mean a prayer group. And what they would do, they would get up very, very early, they would pray, they would study, and then when they had time during the day, they would go visit the jails. They would go help out the poor. And you know how it is in college. Some of their classmates made a whole lot of, well, they made fun of them. They called their little prayer group the Holy Club. They called them Bible beds. And because they were so disciplined, methodical, of course, they also called them Methodist, and of course, that, that's how we got our name, folks. It is peculiar, but that's how we got our name, a name that sort of, sort of stuck down through the ages. Now, John decided, you know, that he wanted to come to the new continent to try to uh, save the colonies, if you will. So he came to Georgia. You know how you are when you're young. I remember how I was when I was young. I wanted to save the world, right? But when you get old, you know that's not the case. But when you're young, boy, you got fire in your blood. And John had fire in his blood. And he went to Georgia, and he fell in love with a beautiful Georgia woman, Georgia Bell, I suppose. And they were engaged. I mean, John was head over heels, but right before they were going to be married, he was jilted. And when this woman came to receive communion from John Wesley in the church there in Georgia, he would not give her communion. And that started a whole big ruckus down there. And before it was over, John was ran out of Georgia and on his way back to England. And he got to England. And of course, he was about as down and out as one could be. And he went to a friend and he confided to him. He said, I stand up in the pulpit every Sunday, but the faith I preach, I do not have. I do not have. I like when preachers are honest, because most of us aren't that honest, but John was. Well, he said, the faith I preach, the faith I preach, I do not have, but that wise, I do believe he was an Armenian. He, he said, John, this is what you do. You preach faith until you have. Keep on preaching. Keep on preaching. Good advice. John finally did get married, but his marriage was not very happy. And after a while, him and his wife, they lived apart the rest of their lives, and even when the poor old lady died, he didn't even attend her funeral. So I hope what I'm saying to this John, you know, when it came to a lot of personal issues, and a whole lot of other issues, John Wesley was far from a perfect servant of Almighty God. He truly was, just like you and just like the rest of us. But I've always found great solace and comfort in knowing that 
despite him. God used him in a mighty way. And God can use each and every one of us in the same way, despite our imperfections, because we all have them. Another great story, of course, is that one night when he was still searching, when he was still doubting, when he was still lacking faith, he was walking down Alders Gate Street, and he happened to hear, I suppose, people singing and praying, and he opened the door and went inside, and he got a seat. And that night, the, mark, the moderator was uh, reading Martin Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. And Wesley heard, he didn't hear these words for the first time, and you know, sometimes we can hear words a thousand times, but then there's that one time when those words make it right into our heart. So when he heard the words, the just shall live by faith. And he said, when he heard those words, he felt the assurance that God not only loved him, but that God had forgiven all of his sins. And he said, of course, that great quote on that night, my heart was strangely what? Strangely warmed in me. I'm not going to get into, I don't get into a bunch of doctrinal stuff and specifics, but I will ask you this. Does anybody know what the Wesleyan quadrilateral is? And if you do, I'm going to give you a trophy this morning. <laughs> Can anybody tell me what the Wesleyan quadrilateral is? What's how we do theology in the Methodist Church? Boy, you're getting close now, I know. <laughs> you did good. Thank you, love God more. Scripture? Reason? Tradition, experience. And that's what separates us from a lot of other churches. A lot of other churches you may use one or two, but when we do theology, it is encased in that quadrilateral there. Now what I'm saying is, is this. I'm glad that we do use reason. I'm glad we do use reason. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to even start that today, but I'm glad we do use reason. And we have an educated clergy in the Methodist Church. I'm glad of that. But on the other hand, there's experience. It's not all up here, we say, right? But it's also in here. And that's what Wesley was talking about. It is something he didn't know, but it just wasn't something he knew up here. It was something he experienced within his Heart. He experienced the assurance of God's love and God's grace and of God's mercy. Don't ever take the experiential out of, out of your faith life, I suppose is what I'm trying to say. John Wesley was 5'6", 122 pounds, which means he was a little fella, right? Of course, I, I know folks weren't as big as we are now back then. I understand. We sort of get taller and all that kind of thing. He traveled 250,000 miles in his lifetime. All of that on what? Horseback and carriage. No other. He preached 40,000 sermons. And the Anglican church didn't like it too much because he just didn't preach in church. Where else did he preach? On the street corners. He preached in the prisons. He preached in the coal mines. He preached in the factories. I mean, he took it out. He took it outside the church. He took it outside the church. He formed societies. He sent out preachers. And when he was 88 years old, on his deathbed, and that's what I always tell people, if I can just, if I can just have my mind sound enough so I can say some final words to people I want to Say then too, but John Wesley had that opportunity right before he died. He found enough strength to turn over in bed. And this is what he said. The best of all is this. Anybody know how it ends? God is with us. God is with us. And if you go to Wesley Chapel, as I'll be going here in a couple of weeks, there's a statue of John Wesley, and that's right at the 
bottom of the statue. The best of all is this God is with us. If we really believe what old Wesley did, that through the good times, through the bad times, even during our power time and our death that God is with us, we will have received a very, very, very precious gift indeed. You know, sometimes, some, some, sometimes it's good for us to look back, see where we have been. Sometimes it's good to look forward to see where we might be going. Uh, I know my, my home church, you know, I, I didn't even know they, they could do things like this anymore. Beverly got on the... Because we all have a heritage. You know, a lot of your folks, a lot of your heritage is this, that you grew up in Elmwood United Methodist Church and been here all your life, but of course we, you know, others of us have a different heritage. I grew up in a downtown church in Fairmont, West Virginia, and, and, and Beverly got on there and it has a whole history of the church, doesn't it? And, and the... Uh, First governor of West Virginia was a, a member of my home church, correct? Well, I was going to, I'm going to do that. Don't you folks, what do you, how do you folks feel about that, right? <laughs> and he happened to be very good friends with Abraham Lincoln. I didn't even know that. Right out of my home church. Out of my home church, there came a bishop one time. Of course, I already knew that. And then out of that same church, after I'm talking about the governor of West Virginia, Right? After I'm talking about a bishop came out of that church. You know who else came out of that church? Yeah, yeah. Me! <laughs> Can you believe that? Right? That's going downhill. <laughs> I believe Governor Pierpont. Pierpont was his name. Yeah. We all got a heritage. It's good to look back and see where we've come from. It's always good to see where we're Going, but the best thing of this, remember, the best thing of this is remember, folks, the God's witness. God's witness. There we pray. Eternal gracious God, we do thank you for your goodness and for your grace and for the gift of this another day of life and for the opportunity to be here once again to sing, to pray, to see each other's face. For this, we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. We will continue our service of worship as we receive our morning offering. <coughs>
so strengthen your hearts in holiness. 